Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Hively from Techstars, and I have two uh, just general misfits here that uh, we're going to have a great time talking about startup communities. Um, welcome. I'm just watching the chat. I mean, this is literally a worldwide event, and uh, we have about 240 people and growing. So thanks for joining us. Um, this is an exciting time for uh, community builders, for economic development champions, investors, uh, entrepreneurial service organizations, uh, us at Techstars, um, for Brad and Ian, and for most importantly, for the founders who makes, you know, who's the engine that makes all of this run. Um, I can't tell you that in this COVID world, how much more conversation there seems to be about um, people starting new companies and doing it in the entrepreneurial communities all over the world. So I can't wait to share some of those thoughts with you. Um, today, we're going to focus on uh, Brad and Ian's new book, uh, uh, The Startup Community Way. You know, it looks, it's really pretty. It looks a little like this, right? Um, these guys might have seen this a couple of times. And, uh, you know, I've had the privilege of working with both these gentlemen over the last three years. We'll talk about more about that in a second. Um, Ian, you know, you, you're uh, uh, part of this. What, how did you get connected with Brad around this book? I'd love for you to set the stage for your involvement in this. Oops. So, yeah, so that's great. Um, Ian, Ian has a chronic crowdcast problem. <laughs> I'm happy to be. I'll pretend I'm Ian. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, here he's back. He's back. Oh, for three. There you go. All right, Ian, you're up. So, why don't you explain how you got connected to Brad and how this book, the genesis of the book? Oh yeah. Story. So Brad and I were internet friends. I like to say, uh, we you know we knew each other. I guess going back half a decade or so, mutual friend connected us kind of shared writing and ideas over the years. And uh, as we got to talking um, about our uh, overlaps and distinct skill sets that it might be time and fun to evolve startup communities. And so that was kind of that, that was about 2016 we started talking. We kicked off work in the spring of 2017. And three years later, you all have a book to read. Um. By the way, the format for this AMA is uh, I got a bunch of questions to steer them. We're going to talk a little bit about the book. We're going to talk about applying some of these principles, some of the work we're doing at Techstars around this. Um, and then we're leaving a lot of time for questions. Um, so uh, what I want to direct you to is you can submit questions at any time throughout the broadcast. Um, there's an ask a question box down on the bottom of your screen. Um, you see it's called ask a question. So fill those up and uh, and when I get a chance after I'm done setting the stage with with these guys, we'll we'll jump over to your questions. Um, the three of us have been living uh, elements of this book over the last three years. and uh, you know, the all the ebbs and flows of trying to bring this all about. But Brad, you know, you wrote Startup Communities coming on eight to nine years ago, or at least it was at least eight or so years ago, probably wrote nine. What have you observed about ecosystem leaders and who took this book as a model for their activities? What do they get right? What do they get wrong? Kind of what's the bridge between Startup Communities V1 and the Startup Community Way? So the timing, so it's precise for everybody, is I started thinking about the idea that became startup communities in 2010, sort of right at the end of the global financial crisis as we were starting to come out of it and the idea of innovation and entrepreneurship was being talked about as the way out. And there was an article that came out in 2010 that talked about innovation and entrepreneurship and listed places around the world where this was starting to happen. The, the phrase startup communities didn't exist, but this sort of general notion was starting to become talked about. And it, the article listed uh, the Bay Area, which of course is not a city, but a, a region, a bunch of cities, uh, New York, Boston, and Boulder. And I remember reading it and Boulder is not like the rest. It's 100,000 people. We fit like in a couple of buildings in one block of downtown Manhattan, one city block, be squishy and a little smelly, but we'd get in there. <laughs> 
And uh, although in the time of COVID, I don't know that we can get that <laughs> distancing way. And so, and that's when I started thinking about it. The book came out in 2012. Um, entrepreneurship was still sort of emergent, but it wasn't emergent in the notion that it was everywhere. Techstars had started to expand and we had programs in uh, Seattle and New York and Boston and Chicago and San Antonio and a few others, maybe London by now. But, you know, this still very emergent phenomena. Uh, and the idea of startup communities was, uh, was new and the phrase was new. And uh, there were a lot of things that these things were called prior to that. Entrepreneurial ecosystem occasionally got used, but didn't mean anything to anybody. Innovation cluster. But most of the time people said, well, we want to do something like Silicon Valley. Like there was some version of that in the, in the conversation. So I wrote the book. Uh, a bunch of stuff has happened in the last eight years, including the democratization of entrepreneurship globally, which has been awesome to be part of and awesome to see. Uh, it was part of the underlying premise that I had uh, in the first book, which was that you should be able to build a startup community anywhere in the world with a, in a city at least 100,000 people. And then I turned that into an assertion that every city in the world that had at least 100,000 people needed a startup community, part of its underlying core. Um, in the first book, for those of you that uh, that read it, uh, I separated between leaders and feeders. Uh, I talked about how entrepreneurs had to be leaders and everybody else supported entrepreneurs. And so I categorized them as feeders. Um, it turns out that that was one of the strong things in the book that got adopted, but also one of the mistakes. And uh, part of it was that was a mistake uh, that uh, in the new books, uh, we've added a third category, which we call instigator, uh, came from this idea that you can't be an organization and lead the startup community. And that was really the point I was trying to get across. But what I, what I made the mistake is I didn't give a voice to all the people in a startup community who play leadership roles who are not entrepreneurs. And that created some confusion because today there's an enormous number of people in startup communities who are not entrepreneurs. They work for feeder organizations, they work for, you know, government, university, nonprofit, large corporations, many of them, their job is to help support the startup community and play active roles in it. Um, many of the leaders in the startup community are those people. Many of them are also leaders who are in between things. So they may not in the moment identify as an entrepreneur. And still others work for startup companies, but are not the founders of those companies. So Ian and I created a third category called instigator. And uh, that word we bounced around a lot on. So hopefully that word la lands well with everyone. And uh, if you think about the segmentation, leaders and instigators are people and feeders are organizations. So really the key separation here is that the leaders have to be people and uh, everybody else that's an organization, all the organizations are feeders. We also spent a lot of time and, and Ian did this work uh, in detail. And I would say I participated at a summary level of looking at everything that had come out in the last decade or so around these notions, especially uh, around efforts to create structures to define how these things worked, which of course, if you, when you read Startup Community Way, you'll understand that that's antithetical to the actual way they work. Trying to organize from the top down doesn't work, which I said in Startup Communities, but we really reinforce in Startup Community Way. <clears throat> but much of what people uh, have done in the research and, and also in different organizations have tried to create structure uh, from the top down and this is where the phrase entrepreneurial ecosystem really emerges from. And so another thing that we did very deliberately in the new book is we separated between the ideas of startup communities and what they do and what their mission is and entrepreneurial ecosystems and what they do and what their mission is and how the two interact, which hadn't really previously been done. That's one of my favorite evolutions uh, um, Ian, that Brad just talked about is the startup communities versus entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, love for you to kind of riff on that. And what is what have you kind of kind of evolved to in, in terms of those two phrases? And what do they mean to you? Muted. Ian, you're muted. <laughs> 
You look very engaged, but you're muted. Yeah, of course, passionate. right? Thank you. <laughs> uh, keeping with that technological glitch theme, I can't see or hear Brad, so excuse me if I repeat a little bit here. But on the uh, the community's ecosystem dynamic, um, you know, this this is something that evolved over a few months of discussion, where <clears throat> you know, and it kind of goes back to the the core of the book, uh, where we pivoted from you know this approach that was more straightforward, that neither of us liked to where we ultimately landed, which was um, using complexity science to explain the behavior of startup communities and entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, it was driven by this observation that there are sort of, now this is a huge oversimplification, but sort of the two camps, right? You have entrepreneurs and community builders on one hand, people who live this day in and day out. Um, and on the other hand, a wide range of actors who want to engage that has grown in size and scope uh, since Brad wrote Startup Communities you know, eight, nine years ago. And the observation is more than just that these organizations are structured in a different way. We talk about a lot about hierarchies, kind of top-down approach versus networks, horizontal integration, bottom-up. But really that there was a difference in um, the incentive structure and I would say the quantity and nature of touch points. So the community we describe is the beating heart of entrepreneurship. Uh, in a community, it exists fundamentally to help entrepreneurs succeed. Um, it's driven by not just that mission, but also a sense of identity, kinship, you know, uh, love of place and each other. And so it's kind of the merging of the ecological definition of community and the more familiar definition. And we describe the entrepreneurial ecosystem is those range of other actors, resources, investors, universities, governments, and so on, which are super important to um, the outcomes that are achieved by entrepreneurs in those communities, but they engage in a fundamentally different way. And that form of engagement is actually inherent. And so we wanted to describe these two reinforcing but distinct phenomena. I know it's been important, Ian, for you and I to kind of evolve to that in terms of setting up this practice that we have at Techstars. Um, if I could just take that one more place, is there any kind of, um, I'm setting up something that I usually talk about, but I want to see if you actually agree with it. The idea of these Russian nesting dolls, is that, that there is kind of a, um, the startup community is kind of the smallest of the nesting doll and the ecosystem sits around that. And jump on that and riff on that for a second and share maybe what, uh, in terms of growing an ecosystem and being an ecosystem builder, kind of how does it change your focus potentially? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, one of these distinctions, and again, if, you know, I believe Brad maybe was talking about leaders, feeders, instigators introduced that concept. And so uh, with the feeders being organizations, instigators and leaders are people. And so um, the instigators uh, you know, may work for a feeder organization, often they do. Uh, they have a full-time job and they work with entrepreneurs you know, in their free time. Um, and so you know, this issue with you know, kind of this nesting doll you talked about, like you've got the community at the center, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, outside of that is an innovation ecosystem and so on. And I guess the point being that you know, um, you know, the mandate for these different actors, it's not that they're, it's a, it, these incentives, these differences of approach, scope, understanding of entrepreneurial phenomena will vary widely as you move further out. So a classic example is, you know, government supporting startup communities, right? Um, government has a much broader mandate than entrepreneurs succeeding, right? They really care about job creation. Now we can, Go walk through why a vibrant startup community will lead ultimately to job creation in a community. But understanding those distinctions is super important. Uh, thanks for that. And that, uh, I just, it's something that I think about every day in terms of uh, how we are helping some of our um, other ecosystems. Brad, one of the things that I, that I think is really interesting in the book is um, something that are called myths. And you guys outline a bunch of myths. And these are things that ecosystems make or believe, or maybe, I don't know if they're mistakes, but they're a, they're a concept that maybe is, is not inconsistent with the way that you guys are thinking about this. 
I'd love for you to share, you know, one of your favorite myths or, you know, one of the biggest ones or ones that you think is the hairiest. And uh, let's riff on that for a few minutes. Yeah, well, the chronic recurring myth uh, that we've approached completely differently in terms of addressing with the startup community way is the idea and the statement that, you know, one hears over and over and over and over and over again, which is there's not enough capital here. And uh, in 2012, uh, I addressed that uh, through a couple of examples of how to generate capital and how to change the view of there's not enough capital here in the context of startup communities. But in the startup community way, we redefined what the word capital means because we recognized that when people said we don't have enough capital here, what they were really saying is we don't have enough money here. Uh, or We don't have enough financial capital here. Uh, which, by the way, sometimes is true, but most of the time is not. Um, it, that most cities have plenty of financial capital. It's not just it's it's just not necessarily oriented or aimed at investing in startups. And there's a bunch of stuff you can do about that. Uh, but as part of that, we created a construct, and I credit Ian for this. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a blog post soon about how it evolved from the five capitals. Ian can't hear me yet, so I can say whatever I want about him. Or can you hear me now? Oh, he hears me now. <laughs> Busted. Uh, hopefully Ian will write a blog post when he has time about how it, how it emerged from the five capitals to the six capitals to the seven capitals. And what we did was we redefined the notion of what capital is. Um, not enough fundamental way, but just in the way that people were talking about it with regard to startups and startup communities. And if you think about a startup community, financial capital is one of the seven. And you have six other types of capital, and, and we'll spend a bunch of time talking about the six here. But um, they are things like uh, intellectual capital, or network capital, or infrastructure capital. And so you end up in this place where, you know, you can build on the different types of capitals that you have. And every startup community has real strengths in terms of certain types of capital that they have a significant amount of, of and others where they have less. And the dynamics of the complex system that you want to put energy, significant energy into the capitals that you have resources of. And as you have resources for those capitals, um, you want to build them up in a positive feedback way, and that will then attract capital that you don't have or the types of capital you don't have. So there's some very systematic things you can do over time and leveraging capitals that you have an abundancy of and capitals that you have a dearth of in a startup community, but in a co-linked way. And that that's the concept that we bring, up, bring about. And it's uh, it's very powerful for two reasons. One is I think it changes, uh, we think it changes the way that you know, people think fundamentally around this notion of capital uh, and, and dive, uh, expand it beyond just money. The second is it gives you a much better language to talk to everybody in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, not just in the startup community, but in the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem about what you have today and what you need to work on to have more of and what actually is not the thing that you should be putting energy against because it doesn't have a positive feedback or a flywheel effect going yet um, around this notion of capital. Yeah, I love that. And 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 Ian, and in, in the work that we've done in various communities around the world, what happens when there is an over focus or when they are, have fully embraced the myth that more capital equals better ecosystem? What are some of the ramifications of that kind of singular thinking? When there's an over focus on one thing. Yeah, especially financial capital. Yeah, well, um, well, you miss all these other important things. And let me talk about one thing that uh, I take away from, you know, a concept in the book that uh, we've seen play out nicely in Buffalo. Um, so this, we talked about this idea of leverage points, um, which are can be thought of as small intervent, seemingly small interventions in a system that are applied consistently over some period of time, and they have high impact. Um, often these are the result of experimentation, learning, adaptation. You try a bunch of things, you know, many of them won't work, um, some of them will, um, but in the case of Buffalo, um, 
there was a highly engaged community. Um, there has been. There are a number of ecosystem support actors. Um, what was missing was one of the things that was missing to really bring it all together uh, was a, grass, a grassroots bottom-up initiative um, led by entrepreneurs, bringing entrepreneurs together. And I talk about um, talking specifically about the Buffalo Open Coffee Club, uh, which you know, very simple thing, right? Getting people together every you know once a week to have coffee and just talk. And my observation is that by creating this uh, focus point, the center of gravity, it really had high leverage impact for that community. Now, what will ultimately carry it forward might emerge from that um, that interaction, but. I think just kind of adding on top of this, you know, one of seven capitals idea, it's oftentimes it's some of these really simple things that um, have a really high impact. So, you know, my advice would be before thinking about, you know, designing some elaborate publicly funded venture fund, you might think about running events that provide coffee to entrepreneurs. Something as simple as that can have a big impact. Um, thanks, Ian. Staying a little bit on this thread, one of the things that I think that why people enjoy capital is is if you ask every entrepreneur what they're missing, they all say, well, I need more capital, right? There's not an entrepreneur in the world who thinks they have too much capital. Um, so to that end, um, one of the other artifacts of an over-reliance on financial capital as a means is it's also something that is a number, it's measurable. So Ian, your background is as an economist, a researcher, you have a data-driven view of the world. Tell me, and there he goes again. Uh, Keep going, so, Chris, I'll yeah, answer. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, so what, what is the role that kind of measurement and data play um, in, in an ecosystem? And we all know that the, some of the funders and power brokers, um, some of the funders and power brokers that are trying to, you know, put some, so put, put some pressure, you know, on growing their ecosystem. You know, when they, when they have this over-reliance on capital, what are the measurement, you know, kind of jump into this whole measurement myth and kind of how they're, these two are pretty closely related. Yeah, so, so we have a, a chapter in the startup community way, uh, it's actually chapter 11, I happen to know the number, uh, called the measurement trap. And uh, even in the first book in 2012, I was talking about, um, the challenges of measuring certain things. Uh, one of the dynamics that exists in modern management theory uh, comes, I think, originally from uh, Peter Drucker line, which is a version that's misquoted often, but the, the current the contemporary version is if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. The problem with that statement, it's not a false statement. The problem with that statement is that it's, it's not, it doesn't have the right nuance. If you don't measure the right things, you can't manage them. And the key is the right things. And in startup communities and entrepreneurial ecosystems, uh, what gets measured, usually under the justification of if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Also under the justification of how are we doing or how are we doing compared to other city or how are we doing compared to last quarter or last year? Um, the dynamic around uh, the measurements is that people measure the easy things rather than the important things. And so instead of manage, measuring stuff that matters, we end up with these endless measurements of things that just don't matter. Um, and an example of that would be that we end up measuring over and over and over again, things like number of new investments, uh, number of companies created, number of unicorns, number of dollars invested, number of this type of event. And so uh, when you do that, what you're trying to do is create another problem or you create another problem, uh, which we refer to in the book of the more of everything problem, where there's this, endless desire to have more of everything, which does not necessarily um, drive progress in a startup community or in an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and anybody who scaled a business recognizes that more of everything doesn't actually work, um, especially as you're, as you're trying to scale things that have a lot of interacting parts. The important sort of place this leads to is not don't measure anything, 
and that there's no value in measurements. There are certain values and different kinds of measurements, but it's understanding where the real importance lies. And we talk about in the book extensively the difference between parts and the interaction of the parts. Uh, in a complex system, in a startup community, uh, the key is to measure the interaction of the parts and understand the interaction of the parts, not the parts themselves. So just measuring parts doesn't get you anything. Um, just measuring number of interactions doesn't get you anything because you can have a lot of interactions that have extremely low value and extremely low efficacy. So it's, again, you start to get into like, wow, how do you measure that stuff? Um, and there are proxies for it and there are ways to do it um, uh, if you want. But even without measuring, if you focus everybody on the actual interactions rather than the parts, and you try to increase the quality of those interactions and the value of the information that moves back and forth around the interactions, you end up with a much more valuable overall complex system. Uh, especially as it unfolds over time. So I saw I saw some fun comments uh, on the side around this. Like it, there's an element of this, I would say that's intellectual. That's that element really feeds into the practical because the thing that inhibits many places, many startup communities from getting additional capital where the capital is not just financial capital is that people focus way too much energy on increasing parts that don't actually matter rather than putting energy into increasing high quality interaction between the parts. And that gets reinforced over and over again by media. It gets reinforced over and over again by, you know, yet another ranking of a thing. It gets uh, over uh, over indexed over and over again by a positive or a negative thing that happens in a startup community where people say fo start focusing on those things rather than understanding what happens from those things. Yep. Uh, a conversation we've all had many, 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 many times. Um, Ian, uh, you started the book as a kind of a consultant with Brad and, and became a kind of a, a good earpiece uh, for you and I over the last few years. But at some point, um, we were able to convince you to join Techstars. Brad's obviously one of the founder, co-founders of Techstars and has been involved for 13, 14 years. Gentlemen, let me ask you this question, bringing this around to Techstars a little bit. You know, as, as what you've watched this company play a role in lots of different ways in helping founders, what role do you think we play and we can play in terms of, you know, what are those observations, experiences that we have that you think play well to help, um, you know, the 282 people that are sitting on this AMA today? And Brad, why don't you go first? I was going to let Ian go first because I answered yeah. his question. Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me? Am I good? Are You're we... good. And you look right. great. <laughs> so I'm glad, my... I'm glad you switched back from your PC to your Mac. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea why my computer does not like broadcast, but the app, this is the mobile app, seems to be all right. Um, yeah, a bunch of stuff. So let me, I'll just maybe focus on two things. Uh, the first is the idea of give first, which, you know, is something that Brad has talked a lot about, which Techstars has adopted um, on the banner. <clears throat> um, it's a really simple idea that is you help people without you know, in a non-transactional way, you're not doing it with the expectation of receiving something immediately in return from the person you're helping. Um, you know, Brad talks about a little bit like, you know, you're, you're expecting to get something. You just don't know from who, where, and what form. I think of it as you're giving to the system and the system rewards you back. Um, it, it really just, um, it makes exchange in an ecosystem where what we're exchanging is generally intangible. We're exchanging ideas, knowledge about specific things, relationships, you know, moral support. They're all intangible things. And it just makes it a whole lot easier if we stop keeping a transactional ledger in our head. Um, in Victor Huang's book, um, Victor Huang's book, um, The Rainforest, he talks about the free flow of ideas, <clears throat> you know, knowledge, capital, 
and so on. And it's about removing the friction or Chris, you talk about viscosity, the whole thing building on what Brad's last comment was, you know, how do you make things, these important things flow more freely? How do we improve the interactions between the parts, which are people, um, which requires trust, relationship building and so on. And give first really is a, a very simple way uh, to remember that in all of your interactions and make sure that that uh, that occurs. The second thing, and you know, and I'm not, I wasn't there at the seat of history, but I think the actual founding of Techstars uh, was a community building exercise that turned into something much bigger. The way I've heard the story told, I mean, there's a couple of things. First was that, you know, Brad uh, was introduced to David Cohen um, through his uh, random day, right? Brad would meet with anyone for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. And had Brad not been doing that, it's possible that he wouldn't have met David Cohen. It's possible that Techstars wouldn't exist, right? And secondly, the way I've heard the story told from the beginning is that their ambition was to just make Boulder an awesome place for startups, you know? And if it didn't work, at least they would have made some new friends in the process, something along those lines. That sounds to me a whole lot like community building, you know, to make Boulder an awesome place. And what Techstars became was, you know, one way to interpret that is it a validation of that way of thinking. Um, I guess the final thing I'll say, putting my research hat back on, that um, <clears throat> there's a small but growing and I would say credible amount of academic research that's looked at, um, you know, the, the efficacy of accelerators. One of the things that's been convincing for me is the spillover effect of an accelerator. Right. We talked to a number of our partners around the world, and it's not just about the 10 companies they're they're viewing that go through an accelerator at any point in time. It's the impact it has on those communities. And so wrapping it all up, I feel like community building is really built into the DNA of what we're doing. And it's been really fun, you know, to work with you, Chris, and so many other amazing people um, to, to, you know, to help more places accelerate their communities forward. Um, it's a hell of a mission, Brad. You know, you're you're. This is you know, TechStars has been a major part of your your life. Um, you know, for 14 years here. What what? Where does ecosystem development fit into this? And what you know? How did we get started three years ago saying let's help? Well, from the beginning. Uh, the approach that Techstars has taken uh, has been a very organic, uh, bottom-up collaborative approach. Um, even with the first accelerators uh, in year two, after we ran the Boulder, the first Boulder Accelerator in 2007, a bunch of people uh, reached out to us about running an accelerator, a Techstars accelerator in their city. And our response was, we don't have any idea whether we've got this thing figured out or not. We're not ready to do another one somewhere else. We want to just do another one in Boulder. We made a lot of mistakes. We can do a lot of things better. And instead of like, you know, we're not going to tell you how this works. Uh, we got involved in a number of other accelerators and sort of shared our playbook and uh, uh, became mentors and involved in a couple of the ones that uh, we did that with early on. We're one in Chicago and one in London, which ultimately then uh, over the years, a couple of years later, the one in Chicago called Accelerate, which Troy Hennikoff had started with a few other people, became Techstars Chicago. And the one in London, which John Bradford started, became Techstars London. So we, we've just always taken this very collaborative approach from the beginning. And I think that's also part of the dynamic with the books is we're trying to create a common language with startup communities and with the startup community way so people anywhere in the world, whether they're working with Techstars directly or not, has a way to actually have the conversation. And then from a Techstars perspective, as we become a global organization, uh, we view it as a, a, a thing that we can help wherever people want us to help and lots of different dimensions. So almost by definition now, there's Techstars activity uh, in almost every city that has you know, any critical mass of people around entrepreneurship because of Startup Weekend. Right. And the idea that there are startup weekends happening all over the world all the time. Um, you know, the accelerator footprint uh, is now a global one. Um, the mentor uh, network and the mentor footprint now a very long one, like on and on and on and on. So the, the essence of the dynamics around this over the last, uh, you know, 
14 years since we started Techstars was this evolution about three or, three or four years ago when, when we all started talking about you know, ecosystem development, as we said, hey, there's a lot of a lot of cities in the world that really want to apply uh, these startup community approaches. And, you know, they want us to be involved somehow, not necessarily, again, top down to run them and organize them, but bottom up to help them become connected into the Techstars network. And as part of them being connected into the Techstars network, sort of get all of the network effect broadly and for us to engage with their startup communities in a much more substantive way uh, than, for example, just the startup weekend. And, you know, that's obviously been a thing that Chris and Ian have been driving uh, through the ecosystem development activity. Um, and, you know, my view, if you wind the clock forward a decade from now, would be that Techstars is actively engaged in many, many more cities uh, in a substantial way um, beyond just having an accelerator in a place. Um, and that those cities view Techstars as a network that helps entrepreneurs succeed that's much more just running an accelerator in my city. And I feel like we've made you know, great progress on that in the last five years uh, on a number of dimensions, and this just takes it up to another dimension. Yeah. I want to I I make a side comment, um, uh, and then I see Ira's comment, and, and I want to just comment. I want to say something about that as well. Um, the side comment I've seen a few times, one of the articles had this, and somebody texted it or, or commented it. Uh, uh, Marty, thanks for your comment, by the way, about better startup ecosystems around the world. My, my comment is, uh, con is a constructive one, not a critical one. Um, I have learned over the last decade through both of you know, the Startup Communities book, Venture Deals book, and a few other books that I've done, that words and phrases matter a lot. And uh, one of the things that uh, Ian and I really focused on, and of course the feeder leader instigator thing is a good example of that, where I didn't do a good job with feeder and leader. Like I, I messed that up in that first book. And uh, it was very powerful, uh, but in another way, it really created this one-up, one-down relationship between feeders and leaders that was not intentional. I, I would encourage everybody listening to really be careful with the, fra the, with the, the words entrepreneurship, ecosystem, startup, and communities. So the two distinct things, there's a startup community and there's an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And what you'll see over and over again is people refer to startup ecosystems or entrepreneurial communities. And that's, those are not things. And it's part of the thing that mixes up the participants and how the participants interact with each other and what the goals are. And you know, to say it simply, right, we put the startup community, Ian said this, but I'll reinforce it. We put the startup community at the core, at the center. And the goal of a startup community is really simple. It's to help entrepreneurs succeed. That's it. So when you do something in the context of a startup community, it should be done with a focus on helping entrepreneurs succeed. An entrepreneurial ecosystem has more people, more actors involved in different ways that have different motivations. You can have those same actors involved in the startup community. Their activity in that context is to help entrepreneurs succeed. When you scale out to the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem, as Ian said earlier, you know, government has other motivations. Or maybe Chris said, government has other motivations than just helping entrepreneurs succeed in the context of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And that's fine. That's good. But it's important to recognize that. Um, Nonprofits supporting entrepreneurship have other objectives in the context of entrepreneurship other than just, quote, helping entrepreneurs succeed. Um, large companies that are helping the startup community be successful and helping entrepreneurs succeed have other motivations in the context of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in that city than just helping startups succeed. So our entrepreneurs succeed. So as you sort of play through that, I just want to say that distinction is one that we're trying to really land with the startup community way, because I think for the next decade, it's gonna be really important, especially coming out of the current crisis that we're in. Um, because the current crisis that we're in with the COVID crisis is creating enormous, enormous dislocation in many aspects of our society across the world. And not just on a health basis, not just on an economic basis. I talk about a mental health crisis that is now ensuing, and I think that people are talking about. It. I started talking about it in uh, end of uh, end of April, 
uh, that it was coming. And I think now people are understanding what this sort of abnormal experience that we're having is creating as a different layer of challenge. And, you know, in the U.S., we have a reamplification of a, a racial equity crisis that's been going on since the beginning of our country. We're rolling into an election like there, there's going to continue to be massive dislocations that are complex systems. We don't know what's going to happen with them. And so understanding like where your focus is at any moment, I think, is super important, whether it's on helping entrepreneurs succeed or if it's scaled out some on other activities and being able to talk to people in that context, I think is really important. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Cause that distinction is kind of the core to everything we've been talking about. I think the core of the book, um, we have about 15, 16 minutes left. So I'd love to do a bunch and I'm going to go to the questions, by the way, reminder to everyone down at the bottom of your screen, ask a question. You can also vote up questions. So see which ones you want and I'll kind of try to start at the top and move down. Obviously, we're not going to have a chance to do all of them, but we'll commit to hoping to um, answer these questions online, which will be part of the Crowdcast that you can get to afterwards. Um, Ian, let's start with you. Are there pre-existing conditions in a community that um, either support or extinguish the possibility of an ecosystem develop, developing? So are there any pre-existing conditions that you must have? Yes, you have to care. People must care. Great, love it. Rapid I said, fire. I said rapid fire. <laughs> Brad, something you and I have talked about, the idea of- That's gonna be such a challenge for you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Genetically incapable. All right, Brad, Brad in, in one hour or less, um, <laughs> you and I have talked about this. We've, you, uh, you've talked on, about polar stars. These are um, multi-headed communities. This is Boulder and Denver, Raleigh and Durham, Ann Arbor and Detroit. The list goes on and on. Talk about how multiple communities or cities can be part of a larger entrepreneurial ecosystem and still be individual, yet also support the whole. So this is this is a really fascinating phenomena that I think is becoming much, much more important on two vectors. One is uh, what we've learned about non-urban startup communities or rural startup communities, uh, especially among smaller cities over a bigger geographic area. And the same principles apply to non-geographic startup communities. So the idea that in, you know, in, in the world of COVID, place matters, but we are also now dealing in a, play, in, a, in a world where we're much more distributed and we're much more comfortable or ready for or forced to be in a remote uh, and distributed context. And so the... Uh, the, the, the phrase that uh, Chris is talking about is, is a phrase that I've been using for a while uh, called binary stars. And for those of you that know uh, physics of binary stars, instead, you know, if you're a planet and you have a moon, the planet orbits around the moon, or if you're a planet, you orbit around the sun, you orbit around the sun. Binary stars orbit around each other. So they're separate and distinct, but their, their relative gravity causes there to be an orbiting effect, an interaction effect between them. Examples of startup communities that are binary stars would be Boulder and Denver. We're 30 to 45 minutes apart. You know, culturally, they're very different cities. People choose to live in Denver or Boulder for different reasons. There's a lot of, you know, free flow movement between the cities. Um, lots of employees and lots of companies who are entrepreneurs who might live in one but have activity in the other or friends or network or second offices. And how those two startup communities interact with each other is it's not that one is uh, senior to the other. It's not that one orbits around the other. It's that they orbit around each other. And that interaction effect matters. Uh, a Canadian version of that is Toronto and Waterloo. Anybody that knows Toronto and Waterloo, Toronto is this gigantic city. I had six million people or something crazy like that, which to me is like, you know, 60 times too many people in a city. Um, and and uh, Waterloo is a couple hundred thousand people. Uh, Ann Arbor and Detroit would be another example of this. You can think of them as very distinct. And at moments in time, like Ann Arbor, if you're in Ann Arbor and you say, well, you're, you know, you're part of the Detroit startup community, aren't you? No, you know, that's no like way. the worst thing in the world. If you're in Detroit, you're like, hey, you're part of the Ann Arbor startup community. It's like, you're kidding me? You know, that little college town? Um, but they, they influence each other and they orbit yeah. around each other. And there's a lot of back and forth. And so understanding that, again, I, I re realized that was rapid fire and I'm now doing six answers, so I'll finish. Th that's the notion. And just 
to extend it, and we talk about this some in, in both books, think about how that applies to non-urban startup communities. And that same concept, which I think Ian and I are now developing some, uh, which we did a little bit in the book, but not a lot, was virtual startup communities and how that evolves. Brad, uh, this uh, obviously, hopefully will be rapid fire. I asked you one question. What is a, What can a community leader do like, what did you do in Boulder okay, to, support, to support Denver? What is the one thing they can do? Uh, I'll, uh, two things, right? One is, I can't, you can't give one, I have to give two. Number one, if I'm a, if I'm a community leader in Boulder, uh, do two things, and they're linked. One is invite and welcome the community leaders in Denver to Boulder and have them engage with me as a leader and as the community. Number two, go to Denver and engage as a leader in Denver. So it has to be both directions. Yeah. Vote with your feet. But with your feet, but both directions, not yep. one direction. Yep. Ian, community colleges. What role do community colleges have in a community and an ecosystem? Could I quickly answer <laughs> the first question and then the previous question, and then I'll take a stab at this. Let me approach it from the other way because this is super important. Um, Brad's talking about what can a leader do. I want to say, I want to talk about what can you do if you are trying to get yourself, if, if you're interested in engaging with entrepreneurs, becoming a community builder, looking for entry points and meeting with entrepreneurs, listening to what the needs are, what the challenges are. One of the things that I love to do when I go to a new city, you know, whether I'm relying on my network to set me up with folks or not, um, yes, I'm going to answer this on my own time, uh, is I like to Google and see how how easily can I find critical people in this network, right? Startup Prague, startup Barcelona, whatever. How interesting can a can my day be? Can a single day be just by, you know, googling around and you know making my way around town? And so that's like actually, um, if that if it's organized in a flat structure and a network and it's fairly easy to get plugged in. <laughs> um, I view that as a healthy, one sign of a healthy startup community. So that's what people can do. Look for entry points, listen, connect, collect dots, connect dots um, later on. Back to the question of community colleges. Well, so I uh, could go on and on about this, but um, I would view, I would, I would recommend to community colleges to view themselves as one part of a system Oftentimes the larger universities tend to view themselves as the entire system or distinct from the larger startup community in the city which they're located. But to view yourselves as, uh, as one part of a much larger system, to realize that the user, your customer, is the typically the student, the entrepreneur, and to look for ways big and small to help them. It doesn't necessarily have to be some large scale program, real estate, um, but just looking for ways, uh, listening to your students' needs, helping them, um, you know, providing on ramps into entrepreneurship and helping them build better businesses. Um, two answers. Brad, is you you dabbled about rural? Is what is is there a perfect size or a minimum size population community that can have a startup community? Um, and if so, why? And if if not, like what what are the aspects? Maybe the conditions that need to be around available. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know that there's a minimum size yet. I'm still learning. So I'm going to give two quick examples of places that I know well. Um, uh, one is Aspen, Colorado, uh, and one is Homer, Alaska. Aspen, Colorado is 5,000 people, permanent residents. Uh, Homer, Alaska is 5,000 permanent residents, same size. And the geographic footprint of each city, if you like think about the city, roughly the same size. Um, Aspen is part of an extended startup community now called the Roaring Fork Valley Startup Community. That if you know Colorado extends from Aspen to Glenwood Springs and includes basalt and Carbondale and a bunch of stuff sort of in and around. Um, Carbondale, uh, is turning into a very vibrant startup neighborhood all by itself. And the time it takes to get from Aspen to Glenwood Springs is about an hour. 
So the way I think, like to think about it is if you put a dot in the middle of Aspen and draw a circle with a radius of 50 miles around it, that's the Roaring Fork startup community, Roaring Fork Valley startup community. Homer, if you put a dot in it and drew a circle of 50 miles around it, you'd still have 5,127 people. There's nothing in that spot. And the next town over that has any substance, which is called Saldotna, which is about 70 miles away, has 5,000 people or maybe 10,000 people. Just not enough in that disbursement of critical mass in terms of place. So those are very similar cities. The other big characteristic that's different is Aspen has, I don't know the exact number, but I hear numbers like a million to 2 million people a year that don't live in Aspen go through Aspen. Ski season, summer, second houses, friends, business events, conferences, music festivals, all kinds of things. Homer, um, uh, there is a motorcycle festival uh, that makes its way all the way up to Homer from Florida, uh, where all of a sudden 500 motorcyclists come into town. And that's about it. Um, so the dynamics of place matter in that context in a physical sense. And again, I think Ian and I figured out some stuff, but we're still learning how those work. My suggestion if you're in a non-urban center is to try to aggregate linkages to all of the small cities around you and then try to figure out what's unique about that cluster. So like in Aspen, what's unique about Aspen is all of this travel back and forth. By the way, the Vail Valley or Summit County in Colorado would be another example of this where they have tons of travel in. And so you have people coming from around the US and around the world, figuring out ways to engage that in a way where people don't just come and ski for a week and leave. And it takes a while. And you know, like my goal is to come ski for a week. I may not be interested in engaging with the startup community, but interestingly, most people who are entrepreneurs um, will find some time to engage with that stuff when that stuff starts to happen and, and you start to see it writ, writ large. Last comment on this, and then I just wanna come back to virtual. Um, I, I think that in the next five years, the virtual dynamics of this will be crucial um, to our society. And that helps these small places because you can be in a small place because you wanna be in a small place. You can be connected to the other people in the small place, but you can have a larger startup community that's less place dependent that adds to your place. Uh, perfect way. Uh, in other words, it doesn't matter where you're sitting today, uh, you're gonna be connected and there's a way to connect you that provides value to both you individually and you as your organization and you as your, your city or region. So I wanted to um, bring this to a head and, and do a little bit of housekeeping. This, um, this Crowdcast is available on the Techstars Crowdcast platform. You'll be able to re, you know, uh, review this, listen to it again, see the, see the chats on the side. There's been a bunch of links. Um, uh, I've, uh, I've added the link to a new community platform um, that's been started with coincident with the, uh, on the Mighty Networks. Um, startup-communities.mn-co, that's in here um, in the chat. Uh, and so please join us there. Um, in addition, if, uh, if any of you are interested in hearing how Techstars might be able to help you accelerate and drive your community forward, um, just hit us up on uh, techstars.com slash ecosystem-development. Just give us your name, Ian or I will jump on a call. We'd love to hear about what's happening in your community and, and the different ways that we can help. Um, uh, lastly, uh, be, you know, we'll, we'll add you all to our, to our email list. We're going to, we're going to start a, um, a, uh, a series of, of these AMAs. We're going to do some deep dives on specific subjects around that are in the book, um, that we're, that Ian and Brad and I are kind of observing and experiencing among all of our, um, partners that we're working with. So. Um, look for an announcement about that. We'll be hopefully setting those up in the next couple of weeks and they'll be running on a continual basis with specific deep dives on various subjects. So we can really get into the nasty stuff and see how we can arm you all to help you do a better job um, and keep advancing your community. So with that, I wanna thank uh, Ian. Ian, thanks for getting your technology right, uh, finally. Um, I'm glad that we could be part of you finding the right combination of things. Um, thanks, <laughs> thanks for all the hard work you've done on this book and the science that you've, you've uh, helped find and, and cultivate for us. And Brad, as always, thanks for being uh, a leader and a voice of uh, 
of everything having to do with supporting founders and startup communities. So I wanted to thank both of you. And uh, we'll see both of you in a couple of weeks when we jump in again. Thanks for the opportunity.